All right. As I previously stated, I'm Eliza Bowling. I am the public health advisor for NIHB, and this webinar series is going to be on Superfund sites. Uh, our speakers for the day are Ms. Summer King and Aubrey Rakes, who is my um, co-worker. A brief thing about Ms. Summer is she is an environmental scientist for the Kwapa Nation's Environmental Department. She has a master's degree in industrial management and a bachelor's degree in environmental management. She primarily works on the Tar Creek Superfund site in North West, Northeast Oklahoma in partnership with EPA, the state of Oklahoma and the Kupal Nation and on the Cherokee County Superfund site in Southeast Kansas. She's often charged with conducting sampling activities on active Superfund remediation sites and is involved in the remediation process from planning to final reporting. She is also a liaison to colleges and universities conducting research at Tar Creek. As such, she can be found doing everything from migratory bird counts bird point counts to asset mine discharge analysis. She's a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation and enjoys spending time with her family and her five dogs, as well as traveling. My coworker, Aubrey, is an environmental health coordinate, project coordinator here at NAHB. She works on projects related to climate health and environmental justice, and is interested in understanding how the environment affects human health. Before joining NAHB, she worked at the Great Lakes Intertribal Epidemiology Center, and she received her Bachelor's of Arts from Binghamton University in Environmental Studies and has an MPH in Environmental Health Sciences from the University of Albany. Um, brief thing before we get started, if we have questions, because I'm sure we will, let's keep them to the end. You can put them in the chat and I obviously can read them for you or at the end, you can always raise your hand and or come off mute and we will allow questions at the end. Um, if there's no concerns, we shall get started with Miss Summer. Hi guys. Um, good afternoon. I want to, while I work on sharing my screen, I want to uh, have a quick apology. I know that this webinar uh, ended up getting rescheduled uh, because I got sick. So um, good afternoon. Again, my name is Summer King. I'm the Senior Environmental Scientist at Quapaw Nation. And we are located in the far northeastern corner of Oklahoma. And today I'm going to talk about our work on the Tar Creek Superfund site. And I'll touch a little bit about our work in Kansas. So back in the day when Tar Creek was discovered, I mean, we're talking 1905, um, this mining law of 1872 kind of ruled the day. I am not an expert on this. Um, I, I pull in somebody in my department, but I'm just going to kind of touch on it because this is the type of thinking that created our problem today. So um, back then, they didn't have an environmental protection agency. There was no health and safety organization. You just kind of did what you wanted to do, um, regardless of um, any kind of harm or exposures you were, um, you know, exposing people to. So... Again, you know, they they didn't didn't think about the environment, didn't think about what they were doing. It was very much a uh, mining company's rule today. Uh, federal land managers weren't allowed to say no to uh, to mining on public lands. So, you know, there are lots of abandoned hard rock mines out west. Um, this is, you know, the kind of thinking that that led to the day. The last I looked, there was something like 100,000 abandoned mines out west. You know, Superfund is going to end up paying for a lot of those uh, in the next few years. Um, and abandoned mines have an amazing impact on water. You know, we see this at Tar Creek. This photo on the left actually comes from a subsidence at Tar Creek. So cool. This is not my area of expertise. Um, but a little bit about Quapaw Nation. Um, they originated in the Ohio River Valley, uh, part of a larger Sioux uh, group. Uh, very early on, they migrated down the Mississippi River into Arkansas, where they kind of uh, very much settled in the Little Rock, Pine Bluff, Arkansas area. Um, they were pressured into moving out of Arkansas in the 19, or 1820s. And then in 1833, their reservation was uh, established here in Oklahoma. They had suffered quite a bit uh, in, the, in the move to Oklahoma. And I do want to note that in 
2021, the Quapa Nation's reservation was reestablished under the Supreme Court's McGirt decision uh, that was decided in 2020. So that was a very big deal for the tribe. So this is kind of, uh, this would be their homeland. So the, the black outline is their ter uh, original territories. Arkansas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, a little bit of Mississippi. So you can see Quapaw had quite a, a large territory. And if you can see very up here in the very far corner of Oklahoma, this little bitty square, like 80 square miles, this is where the Quapaws are today. So they they seeded this entire area, you know, millions and millions of acres for about 80 square miles in the far northeast corner of Oklahoma. And once they got here, uh, things got interesting. So there's something called the Tri-State Mining District. Uh, you're looking at the southwest corner of Missouri, the southeast corner of Kansas, and the northeast corner of Oklahoma. And there's a very uh, rich lead belt through here. Um, so mining started in the Joplin area in the uh, mid-1800s. It moved west to Galena, Kansas, um, and the, the Trees area uh, a few years later. And then they just, they uh, just on accident discovered the Pitcher Field in Oklahoma and what would then later on become Tar Creek. So this is all the same mining areas. Just so happens that you've got three states, uh, four counties, four super fun sites, and they all have different cleanup standards. Um, it's a little bit about the history. Like I said, they, mining began in the 1800s. They mined at Tar Creek all the way until 1970. They were mining lead and zinc. Uh, half of the lead and zinc used in both World War I and World War II came from right here in Oklahoma. So it was extremely valuable during the war efforts and uh, wartime, but it produced more than 500 million tons of waste here in Oklahoma. And then we have two primary types of waste. Uh, the photo you can see on the right is what we call chat. It's a it's just a mine tailings. So you can think of, you know, they they brought up all of this rock that had the ore in it. They separated out the ore. The tailings are what's left over. It just gets piled on the surface. Um, they thought that the tailings were, you know, inert. You know, there was there was no harm. They'd gotten all the ore out. That's actually not the case. So all of these tailings are full of heavy metals, in this case, uh, lead, zinc, and a, a fun byproduct of cadmium. So in 1980, CERCLA was passed and created uh, the national priorities list, and then came the uh, the Superfund, which is what we call it today. Tar Creek was an original um, listing on the national priority list in 1983. Yay, we've been on it for 41 years now in September. Um, and like I said, Tar Creek is one of four Superfund sites within this tri-state mining district. Uh, they've been working at Tar Creek since the, the mid-1980s, uh, started with some yards, doing some, some early, early actions. What I mainly work on are the tailings piles. And that that really came around in like the mid 2000s. So, you know, they were doing remedial investigations and feasibility studies in the, the early 2000s, completed in 2007. Our record of decision, which I like to refer to as our Bible, it says what we can and can't do. Um, it was finalized in 2008 and then cleanup began in 2010. And I've got our cleanup goals at the bottom. Um, you know, lead is uh, 500 milligrams per kilogram uh, or parts per million. So I know a lot of places are going to a, a lower lead level. We had a buyout here. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of human exposure. So I don't know that our lead level will drop um, unlike some of the other sites around the country or yards, you know, where they, there's a lot of um, exposure. And again, they estimated at that point, even in the mid 2000s, we had 65 million tons of waste still remaining. From what we've discovered in the field, you can safely double that number. Here is the Quapaw Nation. So this is the far Northeast corner of Oklahoma, uh, far Northeast County. 
you can see all of the, what we call the downstream tribes. Uh, so there are nine tribes in, located in Ottawa County. The, the piece of Tar Creek that I work on is called Operable Unit 4. It lies wholly within the jurisdiction of Quapaw Nation. Uh, so we, we are extremely involved in it and have been since 2001. We have a very large tribal environmental department. Uh, there We now are up to 11 and we have our own construction department. So, so the tribe is doing the, their own super fun remediation work. And my construction department is up to a staff of 90. Uh, when I started, it was about 30. Um, and I've only been here eight years. So we've grown quite a bit in the last eight years. This is what Tar Creek looks like today. This is a, a Google image from, from Google Satellite. So all of those white areas, those are mine tailings uh, to give you kind of some orientation. This is Quapa, Oklahoma. This is where the tribe's headquarters are located. This is the former town of, of Pitcher. You can kind of see all of the old streets. Uh, there are very few people who live in Pitcher these days. Most of them have been relocated. Um, just so happens that my office is right here in the middle of a ghost neighborhood. I very much enjoy that. And all of these white areas, those are all tailings. So this is all contamination, um, 40 square miles. You know, Tar Creek is, is not a small site um, and it's gonna take a really long time to get through cleanup. So the tribe really got involved in Superfund in 2013 um, when EPA had a, a, a contractor out here doing super fun remediation, so doing the, the cleanup. And they were targeting a piece of tribal property that was extremely important to the tribe. It's called Catholic 40. And just a, a, a short background, this was an old Catholic mission school that was here for the Quapaw children so that they did not have to go away to boarding school. So historically, it was extremely important to the tribe. It is tribal trust land, so, so it is land held by the U.S. government in trust for the tribe. And the, the tribe did not want the, the contractor working on that property. They, they had a construction department. They've been slowly building um, building up their, their knowledge and bringing in engineers. And they, they went to EPA and said, hey, you know, we want to do the, the remediation work on this property. And that got the ball rolling. This is a first. And no tribe has ever done super fun remedial action on their own. And so it took some, it took some work. It, it took, um, you know, some negotiations, uh, but they, EPA they approved the nation's work plan. And we started in December, 2013. And on the right, this is Catholic 40. This is what it looked like um, before we started work. So the Catholic school had closed in the twenties due to funding the Catholic uh, church had leased it out for mining. They had essentially destroyed the property. And then when they were done with it, they deeded it back to the tribe. Thanks a lot. So this was during construction. So they found they found these, these building foundations. They were completely covered in tailings. And my construction crew actually went in and excavated this building by hand with shovels to um, keep the integrity of this building uh, for the tribe. Um, we ended up removing over 100,000 tons of these mine tailings. There were two mine shafts on the property that were capped. And it was such a success that, you know, EPA encouraged us to continue doing further work. This is kind of some before and during, um, kind of the same areas of, of Catholic 40. And this is what it looks like today. You know, my goal is everybody drives by and they go, oh, you know, this is doom and gloom. And I eventually I want them to drive by and go, wow, that's such a pretty pasture. Job well done. So just some of our projects, um, we've continued in the last 10 years to, to do more projects, bigger projects, more complicated projects. And we've expanded the, the types and, and we figure out kind of what works and what doesn't. Um, but we're, we're getting, we're getting really good at, at removing tailings and restoring some of these lands um, back to productive use. So 
You know, in 10 years, we've removed 7 million tons of source material. We've got 52 mine shafts and seven subsidences. Um, we're over 600 acres that are fully remediated. And I have um, about 800 acres more that are either in progress or we're working on that won't go to full cleanup now, but will at a later date. So, you know, in 10 years, we've touched almost 1,400 acres um, of the 40 square miles. So we're, we're making making progress. And then the bipartisan infrastructure law gave us a little bit of a boost in funding and it let us try some, some new types of projects. And I, I think that those projects have been a very big success and they're, they're setting us up for success um, in the future. And uh, I think we'll look at some of those. So I just wanted to do a few before and after photos. Um, this is one of my favorite projects that we're doing right now. Uh, this is ironically a, a project that we're not going to go to clean. This is not kind of a full remediation, but to me, it was really, really important to do. So on the left, that is a, a tailings pile and that is Tar Creek, you know, where the site gets its name. And this tailing pile was, you know, literally in the creek. And every time it flooded, the, the creek would come up and it would start washing those tailings and, and taking them downstream. And they found they found tailings from Tar Creek, you know, hundreds of miles downstream, you know, almost into Arkansas, you know, all the way down the Arkansas River, almost to Fort Smith, Arkansas. So we wanted to stop the bleeding. You know, this is this is not we're not surgery. We're not fixing the the problem completely, but we're putting a tourniquet on it. We're stopping the bleeding. So on the right, what we did is we took that chat pile and we went all the way back out of the creek. And then it's kind of hard to see, but there's a there's a series of kind of um, uh, long, shallow ponds, and this is a constructed wetland. So anything that falls uh, on the the remaining chat on site um, get funneled down this ditch. It'll come through this uh, constructed wetland and then be released into Tar Creek. You can't tell, um, but they I planted about fifteen hundred plants kind of in that wetland and thousands more up the ditch and around the, the rest of the site. They're very small, so it'll take them a couple of years to grow. But the idea is that those plants will slow down the water, give it a little bit of retention time. Um, any kind of suspended sediments will fall out before it gets back into the creek. And this will last you know, 10 or 15 years until we can come back and do a full cleanup. There's no point in doing a full cleanup here because there's still missed material upstream in Kansas and upstream in Oklahoma, but we can stop the bleeding at least from this pile. Um, this is another before and after. Um, this is the only site that I have that went back into row crops. Nobody thought that we could get a site clean enough to, to put back into you know, crop production, but we clean up to residential standards. And this site was such a success that the farmer expanded the fields that had been right up next to the chat piles. And now they're, they're in the former remediated lands and you drive by and you're like, wow, that's a really pretty crop land. And you don't know that we removed half a million tons from the site. This is a very typical before and after, um, you know, we deal with these large tailings piles. Uh, this one, the very first day we went to work on it was 50 feet tall and it had a cow up on top of it. It was out in the middle of the pasture. And a few years later, it looked like the photo on the right. Uh, it's a very, um, it's a very nice uh, cattle pasture. And again, you know, the idea is that you can drive by and never even know that you know, we removed 100,000 tons off of that pile. So a little bit about our collaboration. We work really closely with the state of Oklahoma. Uh, they, they looked at the work that we did at Catholic 40, and they came to us and said, hey, you know, you guys are doing this work better and cheaper than, you know, the nationwide contractors. And it's easier for us to write an interagency agreement and basically hire you to do the, the Superfund remediation on the state side of Tar Creek. So that's what we've done. We signed our first one in 2014, I believe. 
And we are now like seven projects deep in uh, for the state. Partnership works really well. Um, state projects are a little bit different because we actually have landowners on site. Uh, the, the tribal projects that we mostly deal with, um, you know, the tribal members don't live there. They still own the property. They still have interest in it, but but not many of them live in picture. But the the state properties, we deal with landowners. And that is, uh, it's, it's a really interesting challenge. Mm-hmm. But this, this collaboration with the state of Oklahoma has also been a huge success. So one of our big projects right now this is by far the biggest project that the tribe, you know, had had taken on, was a a former milling facility that was uh, in Elm Creek, which is the the adjacent stream to Tar Creek, and this one's called Bird Dog. <laughs> don't ask me why; I don't know. <laughs> but the the total property, you know, acres of more than five hundred. Uh, it is a it's a massive. Uh, project we've been working out here since 2019 we're not done yet um i'm really really hoping that we'll be done with this project next year but so far we've we've touched and moved uh, about 1.6 million tons you know on this project we're not done yet this is one of the few areas that we're going to have um, a consolidation area on site this this property was so massive that we couldn't move everything it it just wasn't cost uh, feasible. So we, we've created this consolidation area. We're going to consolidate probably about a million tons. But what we've done is clean up one, a complete one mile section of Elm Creek. This is what bird dog looked like in December when I got to take the drone out, um, to give you an idea from the very bottom, all the way up to the tree line at the top, that is a one mile section. So down here, you know, you can start to see the stream uh, show itself. And what we discovered was that we could find the original stream bed because that was where the contamination was the deepest. Um, And the the entire site, most of this is is clean. You know, we're still working on on uh, on continuing cleanup out here. And then once cleanup is done, I, I got a little bit of a a surprise bonus side project to, to do with this property, but uh, very, very large project and, and by far the, the largest we've done at Tar Creek to date. Um, this is my little bonus project. Um, the BIA came, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs came through with a, a little bit of restoration money. You know, we, uh, we called them, we're like, hey, I, I have a mile and a half of tribal lands that, you know, we're, we're taking down to nothing. You know, when when we get done with this, it is clay. There's not a tree. There's not a shrub. Um, there's no fish. There's nothing left when we get done with it. We're literally starting this stream from scratch. You know, we're like, hey, you know, I've got, I've got this mile and a half. Can can you help me out? And they did. Uh, they came through with uh, quite a little pot of money for this rest, riparian restoration. Uh, our target is almost 46,000 plants. Um, we're gonna start this spring, late spring. Um, I have to be done by the end of the year. Um, and as you can see in the, the colored boxes on the right, um, we've kind of got some, some planting zones. We're actually gonna start on the bottom in the red square. That project's a little further along and then work all, all the way upstream. So when we get done, we'll have planted about 46,000 native plants. And they're gonna be everything from native grasses all the way up to some, some larger trees. It's kind of gonna depend on what I can source. Uh, so really, really excited about Remediation is very good at, at tearing up things. And this is the first time I'm getting a chance to go in and actually like fix things. So very excited about that. Um, just some numbers, uh, you know, we've, Tar Creek in total, we're, we're getting really close to that 10, 10 million tons of source material removal, uh, probably hit that in April. Um, 184 mine shafts uh, have been capped. Just to give you an idea, there's about 1,300 of them out here. Uh, 40 square miles of mining. Um, 
it's it's a lot of shafts. These case borings were wells essentially down into the mine. So they mined an aquifer. So to keep the, the mines dry, they, they pumped out 30 million gallons of water a day. They used um, 10,000 of these case borings. We've only found 200 of them so far. Um, remediated a little over 1,100 acres in total, um, 28 complete projects, seven in progress, and we have another eight in the planning stages. This is an endless cycle of we finish one and we start two more and we finish one and we start one and, and you know, just this endless loop of always moving, moving further along uh, on the site. Um, there's, you know, some, some good news in the future. As we, as we finish sites, um, we can look at super fun reuse. Um, there's never going to be any additional residential or commercial facilities out here. The, the undermining is just too extensive. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that it can't be productive. You know, it can be row crops. Uh, we, agriculture is, is huge out here. You know, bison, cattle, um, seems like almost everything that we clean up, uh, the tribe's cattle company comes in and leases. And now all of these cleanup projects have, you know, tribal cattle out here that are feeding our tribal members, uh, education and outreach, uh, research, uh, kind of like we mentioned earlier, I deal with about six universities on a on a rotating you know regular basis and I I would hazard a guess that somewhere around a hundred degrees have been earned out here based on you know research that's been done at Tar Creek um, and like I said just because it can't be you know residential or commercial doesn't mean it can't be used you know we've looked at solar development we're in the planning stages of creating a native plant nursery. Um, actually right down here by my office, when we started pricing and looking at the availability of native plants and the sheer number that we're going to need out here, uh, it became very obvious that we were going to have to do something to supply ourselves. So we are, we're looking at starting a native plant nursery. We also started our own compost facility because we can't bring in uh, clean dirt. Like, you know, we take all of this contamination off of a site, but we can't bring the landowner anything back. So the only thing we can use is compost to kind of help give the, the clay a little bit of a boost and, and grow some, some vegetation. Um, compost around here is a little expensive. So we started our own composting facility, um, but it can be you know, wetlands or a nature preserve. There can be recreational areas more research, always more research. But, you know, the tribe is very excited to see you know, what we can create out here out of lands that have not been able to be used for a hundred years, more than a hundred years. And, and they can't be what the tribe would, would want them to be if mining had never happened, but we can still use them. So the number one question I always get is where is everything going? And so if you remember the big map and all of the white areas, what we're doing is we're taking kind of an outside in approach. We're working on the outside areas and it's all going to one big repository. You can kind of think about it as a landfill. So everything, everything that we clean up goes to the central mill repository um, located on the southern edge of the site. And as it's designed right now, it'll hold about 20 million tons. Um, it's still not going to hold everything. We'll probably have to have two or three of these, you know, large repositories, but these have to have operations and maintenance um, forever. You know, they will, they will never be able to be used. So the, the tribe and the state were, were very adamant that we wanted one or two or three of these. We didn't want a hundred. We didn't want, you know, one on every site. Um, ironically, that's kind of how they do it in Kansas. They have many smaller ones at the Cherokee County Superfund site, and, and that is not something the tribe was interested in. So, um, a little bit about some of our collaborative strategies. We work really closely with uh, EPA Region 6 and the state of Oklahoma. We meet monthly, twice monthly, um, you know, as needed to talk about 
how our projects are going, what problems we're having, um, upcoming projects, funding, all of all of the things that go into continuing work out here. But we also do a lot of consultation and collaboration with um, other interested parties, such as the downstream tribes. We have a very local um, or a very active uh, local environmental advocacy group, um, county commissioners, the Fish and Wildlife, um, and we're we're starting these biannual meetings where you know they can sit down and we're going to tell them, okay, here's our here's our three year plan, and they're going to be able to have uh, meaningful input on our plan. So. Um, we, we, as one of my coworkers just said, we have meetings about meetings about meetings. Um, and we have five meetings with different people about the same thing, but we need to make sure that everybody stays informed. And then a little bit about our work in Kansas at the Cherokee County Superfund site. Um, it is also part of the Tri-State Mining District, but it, it would be the Kansas side. So it would be EPA Region 7, in the state of Kansas. Um, we are just in the infancy stages of this. Um, we just signed our cooperative agreement last fall. Um, we're still in the process of getting you know, up and running to, to do work out there. These things don't happen overnight. Um, I have like 14 site plans that, that need to be reviewed and approved you know, before we can step foot on a property. And we're still working through that process, but we're really excited to take what we've learned at Tar Creek and expand, you know, uh, into Kansas and, and show Kansas and Region 7, you know, the, the work that the tribe can do um, on, a, on a second site. And then some of the cultural considerations, um, Tar Creek does cover half of the tribe's reservation. So it is it is a major influencer for the tribe. Um, and as as cleanup was was being researched and they were trying to figure out, you know, uh, the cleanup goals, the tribe uh, paid for this Quaba tribal life waste scenario. and they they had an amazing um, PhD uh, researcher come in and figure out, you know, an understanding of, um, what subsistence activities looked like for the Quabas, historical foods, cultural practices, what kind of natural resources would the tribal members have been using and how much of it if it if Tar Creek had never happened. And so, you know, taking all of those and looking at a, a subsistence diet, they came up with uh, like human health risk assessments and, and all of this like amazing work and came up with cleanup levels that are actually much lower at Tar Creek um, than any of the other um, Superfund sites in the Tri-State Mining District because of these tribal life ways. And so, you know, you know, EPA listened and they they took, you know, the tribe's concerns and how they wanted to reuse the site later into consideration when, when we set our cleanup goals. So that was um, amazing. And, you know, our, our friends at headquarters at the Office of Land and Emergency and emergency management um, are amazing about listening to tribes and taking the you know tribes um, opinions into consideration and giving them a seat at the table and a voice in in this process because they realize that this is the tribe's land you know we're going to be here forever you know contractors come and go others come and go but this is the tribe's land forever and it's the only land they're ever going to get Um, so I guess we're having questions uh, later, so I will uh, stop sharing and we can go to Aubrey. Thank you so much, Ms. Summer. Yes, we will be going to Aubrey now uh, and she'll be presenting some more information about Superfund sites. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I am just going to share my screen and we will get the slideshow started. Can everybody see my screen okay? Eliza, got the two thumbs up, great. Hi everyone, my name is Aubrey Race. I am an environmental health project coordinator at the National Indian Health Board, um, one of Eliza's colleagues. So thank you so much for having me 
uh, chat with you all today. Um, what I'm going to be sharing is a resource that we have on our website regarding Superfund sites that we um, that we created it is a Superfund sites and tribal land story map. Um, so I will share that with you all today. Um, did it swap over to the um, the story map, Eliza? Or is it still the screen, my slideshow? You're, I can see the map, and but now it's on the slideshow of the map. Okay. All right, so now you should be seeing the, the story map. Story map, Awesome. Yeah. So this is just a resource that we wanted to share with you all, um, kind of taking you through different concepts regarding super fun sites. Um, first takes you through a little bit of the history on CERCLA um, and what that entails, as well as what the national priorities list is. I'm sure a lot of you on this call already know what that is, so I don't want to bore you with those details. Um, and also some inf information on the hazard ranking system, how these sites are scored to get onto the NPL. And then the real fun stuff is the map itself. So first here, I just have one that kind of focuses in on the current super fun sites that are either on or near tribal land. Um, so you can kind of zoom through on this embedded map and you can click on a location and it will give you some information, including the hazard ranking score, which could, uh, be very informative. And I also included on here some resources for those who might be looking to start. Um, if, if, there's a, if there's a site on your land, some, so, some resources to refer to to help inform moving forward and getting that site cleaned up. There's some tribal lands assistance center case studies that I have linked, as well as the Intertribal Environmental Council, um, some of their support on their super fun program that is available to their member tribes. So just a good place to start um, and get some information on super fun sites. The real fun comes with this map. Um, this has all the super fun sites that are on the national priorities list and those that are proposed to the national priorities list. Um, so again, there's a whole lot, which is, we love to see that. Um, you can zoom in and out on this map here that's embedded, but I personally prefer to go to use this button on the Superfund, which will pop open um, a second map that is just a little bit more user-friendly for interacting with it, you can use your um, your little scroll thing on your mouse to help, and that I find very helpful. Um, so again, you can zoom in and click on a very on a on a site, for example, Cherokee County, what Summer was just talking about, as well as the Tar Creek super fun site. Um, if you all follow the new sites that are added, you will you will know that there were a lot that were just this this past week added. This map does not reflect all of those, but it will. So stay tuned for those updates. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to talk about um, just caveats to keep in mind when looking at this and where the data sourced where the, the data is sourced from. Um, just always things to keep in mind when working with, with data um, that, especially that, that, especially that is involving um, tribal lands. This is all publicly, publicly available data um, and comes with some limitations as well. I'm happy to answer questions about that. Probably um, I'll share my information if anybody has follow-up questions on that. Um, 
And then finally, I just wanted to plug our Tribal Environmental Justice Technical Assistance Center. Um, so this is one of our new programs at NIHB, and we, um, we do, we can help in any way that you see fit with getting funds that could help um, clean up some of these super fun sites on your reservations. Um, so if you want to learn more, there's links here. Eliza will share these slides with you, um, as well as our TA intake form. Um, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to me or um, our environmental health at nhb.org um, email as well. So that's my quick little spiel. Um, and I will pass it back to Eliza for questions. All right. Thank you so much, Aubrey. I really appreciate you hopping on this presentation for me. And thank you, Ms. Summer. Um, does anyone have any questions? I did see in the chat we had one question. Uh, Ms. Linda, go ahead. If, uh, Dr. Linda, if, go ahead and uh, you can go first. I saw your hand first. <laughs> okay. Thank you. That was quick. Uh, Summer, super presentation. It was so impressive. Incidentally, I've been down to your area and... Uh, mm -hmm. You can taste that in the air. I mean, it's unbelievable. So I, ju I just, I don't even know how to feel about that. But I certainly would like to be compassionate. So I'm going to ask you a question. And I notice we have an EPA um, official uh, on our webinar as well. But my question is this. And it appears from, from your very super presentation, your tribe has the infrastructure to have a very uh, highly qualified lab. And so, you know, there's guidelines uh, put out uh, by our federal friends, you know, on different tolerances and levels and things like that. What I would like to know is if the tribe has measured what they find in, in the air, in the land, what's in the meat from the animals that are on the land, in the fish, and so on, if in the tribe's opinion, it's within limits. You know, you can do your own ordinances and, and, and determine that. But uh, living in an area that's been sprayed with nickel cadmium before, it took me three years to get to U.S. forestry to admit to it. Or we had stillborns and, you know, just god-awful things happened to our babies. Um, and they wouldn't fess up. So that <laughs> that's my urgency. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yeah, we... I think everything has been studied out here. We've we've looked at like lead uptake in row crops. We've looked at metals uptake in pasture grasses and how that, you know, goes up the food chain to the the cattle and the bison. Um, I know we do air, um, water. You know, our our tribal environmental department measures surface waters uh, monthly. Uh, the thing about lead is that the, the national air quality standard is a three month rolling average. So it's really hard. Um, you know, we don't, we don't bust that average. Um, you know, we might on a day to day basis on a really windy day, but you know, when you look at the, the three month average, you know, we, we don't get anywhere close to it. Um, the, like I said in the chat, the biggest thing out here to protect our workers is to control the dust. You know, if I can control the dust, I control the exposure. And if there are days that it's too windy, too dry, you know, um, conditions aren't right, we will shut a site down. I, I am not going to have, you know, a, a young kid come in, get an exposure at 18 or 19 and have to live with that for the rest of his life. I'm not, I'm not doing it. So, um, you know, we'll shut a site down until conditions are more favorable. Um, on the lab, the the tribe is not interested in opening their own lab. Um, and I think that's because we want that third party separation. You know, we use a, a nationally certified lab, but we send our samples to them. We have no control over the, over the results. They come back to us. Um, that way there's no question of, you know, are we you know playing with the numbers and, and stuff like that? It, it comes back to us and that's what it is, what it is. Um, mm -hmm. 
Did I get everything? <laughs> yes, you did. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I saw uh, it's Amanda. I saw your hand go up for a second. Did you have a uh, question? I did not have a question. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize that I raised my hand, um, but I will just take the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, I am Amanda Van Epps. I work at EPA headquarters. I am in our Superfund office at EPA headquarters, and I'm one of the tribal coordinators in that office. So um, it's a, a topic that I work on closely. Um, was had the opportunity last fall to visit Tar Creek and to see Summer's work in action. And they really have done an incredible job of, you know, moving just unbelievable amounts of chat, but you know, it's still, there's still a lot to be done. So it's an ongoing story. Um, Aubrey, I would love to connect with you at some point about your story map um, because it's, you know, it's very interesting um, and, and, you know, would love to make sure that we just have the most current information there. So, you know, we'd love to connect. And if there are any other questions that I can answer from an EPA perspective, I'm happy to do it. Um, I know that also Todd was here. I'm not sure if he is still here, but um, we do have a tribal super fund working group. If anyone is interested in that, um, it's a sort of loose network of, you know, loose email network um, that, that, the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals administers, and we have quarterly calls there on you know topics that are relevant to the Tribal Superfund world. We also have once a year we have in person meetings where we'll visit a Superfund site that has a, a tribe involved. Last year we went to Leviathan Mine, um, where the Washoe Tribe is really really involved, um, and it was a really great experience. So if anyone's interested in the uh, Tribal Super Fun Working Group, I will put a link to that in the chat. Thank you. And Aubrey, I wanted to say thank you for utilizing the Tribal Lands and uh, Assistance Center. That's something that, you know, Todd and, and ITAP and Amanda and I have really been trying to work on over the years and, and you know, keep that up and running and relevant. So thank you. Um, I did see uh, Erica's hand. Oh. Um, Dr. Lindy, wait until um, Erica finishes. Uh, let Erica have a turn. I just, I, I, I just want to, I want to see, ask Aubrey a question. So let Erica go first. Hello, uh, my name is Erica Wilson. I also work at EPA in the headquarters office uh, in the Office of Land and Emergency Management, and I am the Tribal Program Manager for that office that includes Superfund as well as uh, many other of our cleanup prevention and response programs. And hi, Summer, so good to see you. Um, I also went with Amanda uh, to visit Summer last fall. We celebrated 10 years of uh, collaboration between Quapaw Nation and EPA and did um, some other tours in the area. Anyway, it was really wonderful. Um, I also wanted to just uh, put in a plug for the Tribal Lands and Environment Forum. That's a uh, a uh, national conference that we uh, co-sponsor with the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. Um, and it covers all of Olam's uh, uh, cleanup prevention and response programs. So not just Superfund, all, you know, there is a whole track dedicated to Superfund. And we typically, um, the organizers do try to include a field trip to a Superfund site. Um, but we cover lots of other topics, including brownfields, underground storage tanks, emergency response. Um, but it's a great place for folks to come. Um, the vast majority of attendees uh, are tribal environmental professionals, um, although we do get a lot of other folks like consultants and academics, students, um, state and local government and other federal agencies. But it's a great place to learn from each other. Um, it's very motivational for attendees. Um, and it's a great place to, um, you know, hear best practices and lessons learned. There's lots of EPA people that participate, um, but it's great. I, I think most importantly to meet other people that are going through or dealing with the same issues. So I can drop a link um, in the chat and um, just uh, would love to talk with um, any of the folks on this call if they have additional questions for us at EPA. Okay, um, now your turn. 
Okay, so the question I had for Aubrey is I should have known NIHB would be after it. I didn't know you guys had such extensive <laughs> knowledge on this. I've known Stacy for 100 years, it seems like. And so what I want to ask you, will you do a presentation in my class? It happens on Tuesday nights from 6 to 8, and we have till the end of April. Because what we talk about, and I've been teaching this class at the University of Minnesota for about eight years now, uh, it's a hard class to teach. And if you've studied many of the case studies in Indian country uh, with environmental concerns, uh, it'll get you fired up. And then sadly, all, all the abuse that's happened uh, to people that have been uh, cannibalized and, and used as expended uh, workers. And so it just is horrible. But uh, uh, we have one thing that I, that I struggle with. And uh, so if you could do a little research ahead of time for me, the Sanford Act. You know, we have all these issues with uh, uh, watersheds and Standing Rock and all the pipeline stuff. And in Minnesota, we actually have a nuclear plant in the middle of the Mississippi River. Now, figure that one out. But, but anyhow, uh, it seems like whenever the tribal governments go up against the U.S. government, um, if, if they stick with it longer and basically our tribes run out of money uh, to fight it, but that's what happened with the pipeline. Uh, at the head of the Missouri River. So uh, anyhow, it's a tough class to teach. I'd appreciate any insights or any information people can send me because my students are hungry. And they ask me things I can't even begin to answer because I don't know. It's, it's never been resolved. So that's why I asked the question about whose measures you use. Um, and I know a lot of tribes that have ordinances, including the reservation where I live, which has a Superfund site from treated uh, lumber, uh, creosote and penetrate things. So anyhow, thank you so much. I'm sorry to, to ramble on about that, but it just really gets me going, uh, you know, and, and our future, our seven generations are at risk, very high risk. So thank you. Yeah, th thank you, uh, Dr. Linda. Um, yeah, I'm happy to help in any way I can. I will say that at NIHB, we're kind of expanding our environmental portfolio, um, and that's come with a lot of um, help from our, our funding from the EPA for the Environmental Justice Technical Assistance Center. Um, but yeah, happy to connect after and, and uh, see where we can collaborate with you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very grateful for this sharing of resources and opportunities. Um, I don't want to stop the blessings from happening. However, I do want to close out our webinar. If we don't have any other questions, um, obviously, if we want to network, we can stay on. I just want to, you know, open the floor, make sure we don't have any questions. All right. Well, since we don't, um, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us for this webinar series. Um, our next webinar will be on the 13th. It's going to be with yours truly, but in extreme weather preparedness, a declaration, um, disaster declarations um, in tribal country. So um, hope to see you next week on the 13th. Thank you. Thank you.